Your rights are my responsibility. A man has to decide that he's going to do something. And I'm not listening to your stupid classes. Hello everyone, my name is Bill Roach and we are back with another episode of Timeless Dialogues. And today we're gonna look at this issue of has the apologetics movement died? And I think all of us are familiar with the broader apologetics movement because I think we're all familiar with this idea that at one point in time we've recognized everybody was doing apologetics. Every school was doing apologetics. The parachurch ministries were doing apologetics. The radio ministries were doing apologetics. You had podcasts and books and church camps and curriculum here and curriculum there and everybody was doing apologetics. Well, now it seems like things have changed. Have you noticed this? There was a time when everybody was doing apologetics, but now it seems like very few people are doing apologetics or the way that apologetics is being done has just radically changed. You know, we see fewer conferences now, we see fewer big name speakers. Now there are a lot more people who are speakers doing apologetics, but like the key leaders of the apologetics movement are just different, changing all the rest with it. But you've also noticed things like this, that influential groups that once existed no longer exist. It's not like they've just passed the baton. They no longer exist for a variety of reasons. And then you have not only groups that don't exist, or some people have just quit doing apologetics, like certain parachurch ministries have just started doing other things. Or probably where you've seen one of the bigger changes has been in institutions that started whole apologetics programs, and now they've reduced it down to a class, or some of them have almost even eradicated programs all together because you remember at the height of the apologetics movement it was conferences and seminaries and different christian universities and all these others were just adding these programs in why because there was a market for it but things have seemingly changed and what i want to do today is i want to discuss this change and sort of what this tribe of people which i'm very much a part of that tribe of people and what can be done about it because it seems like either apologetics don't exist change what they're focusing on or what they're doing and how they're doing it are just virtually irrelevant so Little background on this, as many of you know who follow this channel, which by the way, I don't say this very much. If you follow this, can you please just like the video, comment on the video, whatever it is. In fact, just comment on the video of what's your favorite apologetics ministry, just straight down below. And we can look at this just for the, the relevance of this. But this is just a, an area that I have spent a long time dealing with. I mean, I was the former, I'm the past president of the International Society of Christian Apologetics. I've worked with groups like Focus on the Family. I was the assistant to Norman Geisler. I've met all the who's who in apologetics, published in the apologetics world, spoke at the apologetics, different conferences and all that. So I don't say that to gloat or to pride. I'm just saying, I know the world. Just like somebody say, if they were in the sporting arena, they could say, I know the coaches, I've been on the field, I've done this, I've done that, and so on and so forth. And what you have to see is, is that there have been shifts that have happened within this movement. And I think what I want to do is I want to talk about this shift and some of the reasons and things that we can do to correct the movement and also bring more relevancy to the movement. So step one is this. There was a time in the past, and I think some of you might remember this, sort of the, the old school apologist, which I'm not old, but I, I know that era, where the apologetics movement didn't really seem to exist, or at least didn't have as much relevance as it once had. And, you know, it seems like the, the height of the apologetics movie, movement was like the 90s, early 2000s, uh, maybe beginning in 2010s and so forth, but it's radically dropped off since then. Like it's not the hot topic anymore, but there was a time in which the apologetics movement was just a few rogue figures. And it doesn't mean that it didn't exist. It just didn't exist in the 
movement type of way. So you always had figures like John Warwick Montgomery, you had Greg Bonson, you had Norman Geisler, R.C. Sproul, John Gerstner, Schaefer, and all the rest. They were doing apologetics ministries, but in many respects, they were like the precursors for what the movement became. And it was sort of the, the overflow of what they were doing gave rise to many of the strong, good, important, relevant things of the apologetics movement. However, what did not exist at that time and what made it so difficult for apologetics to exist at that time is that you didn't have schools that wanted to have apologetics programs. Like I know for a fact, Norman Geisler went to Dallas Seminary hoping that they were going to have a big apologetics program that never happened. And that's one of the reasons he went to Liberty and then started Southern Evangelical Seminary and all the rest, you know. Ligonier Ministries was a type of an apologetics ministry. They did apologetics, but they were a parachurch ministry that was dealing with sort of the whole of theology for the raising up of people within the church, but they were rightly doing apologetics. I mean, then you also had, you know, Schaefer doing his thing at the Labrie. Obviously, Schaefer had a huge influence, but I don't think many people who do apologetics today realize that they were sort of mavericks to what was going on at that particular time. They had to work incredibly hard in order to see the fruit of their ministries and their apologetics ministries and the ways that they did and sort of the way that we understand them today. I think people forget that far too often and we're sort of riding on the coattails of these figures, but the apologetics movement in its fullness was really built upon the shoulders of these kinds of figures. And some of the reasons that we think about it is, is that they had strong theological integrity. They had a deep connection to the local church. They were convictional about things. They weren't swayed to and fro by a whole host of issues. God really blessed them both financially and practically and in the platforms that they had and all the different arenas that God used them. And the apologetics movement seemed to have just birthed out of them. Now, the second thing that I want us to look at is, is that then things radically change. So you had these figures that were working very hard. They were striving very hard on these issues. And then it just seems like the apologetics movement exploded. And that's when I came into the apologetics movement. And I put this somewhere in the 90s, give or take. You know, you had certain schools like Southern Evangelical Seminary. I think they started in 92. You had Biola and their program. Liberty's program was kind of floating around out there. And you had other schools that were doing apologetics. Trinity had their program. It, it started to wane from there and so on and so forth. But the movement itself, as it just exploded onto the scene, I just remember my experience with this. I remember I was not raised in a Christian family. I was by no means a Bible-believing Christian. I would have considered myself some kind of agnostic atheist, hated the church, hated Christianity, felt like nobody could answer my questions, and they really weren't answering my questions, and all these different kinds of things. It was sort of the mood that was coming about, and I grew up in rural Iowa. So if I'm experiencing that in rural Iowa, guess what people in these more urban secular areas were facing at a significantly greater degree. And I just remember it was during this time that it was through the case for Christ with Lee Strobel. And it was through radio ministries like Renewing Your Mind with R.C. Sproul. And it was things like Ravi Zacharias's large ministries that he had that really just propelled me into it. But ultimately, the reason I got into apologetics was through reading those. And I went to Southern Evangelical Seminary. That's a whole story we could tell at a different date. But what I want you to realize is, is look at the way that the apologetics movement grew. You know, what was the messaging that people gave? You know, the, so many of these kids are going off into the universities. We're losing 90% of our kids the second they go to college from Bart Ehrman and from the, the seculars and the campus and the this and the that. And we, we understand all of it. You know, they're, they're interacting with the professor. They get the roommate. They're not going to church. They're not going here. And it's because of these reasons, people are leaving the church. And in many respects, they were right. But in another respect, it was almost this tactic that was just always thrown into apologetics movements where I felt like so much of the time spent was, I would almost say this, informing them about this change. But the reality of it was, is that it scared so many people. It scared so many parents that they said, we got to do apologetics at all costs. So people started having conferences. They started having 
all of these different events. We started having people with huge parachurch ministries. This is when the movement really started to, to blossom in that regard. And that's when sort of the explosion of what I call the evangelical apologetics industrial complex started to begin. You know, so we could summarize it in this sense. It could be summarized as virtually no one had anything to do with apologetics to now everyone has something to do with apologetics. Seminaries were started. We had hundreds of books that were written. We had key leaders of this, this new wave of the movement. These weren't always the same. Some of the older ones continue, but there was like this new wave of key leaders that started to come about Then the movement. Conferences were started everywhere. Massive conferences, conferences within churches, conferences at schools. Ratio Christi was started a little later at this time, Fast forward another 10, 15 years, right into the early 2000s. Speakers were formed. The whole movement was put together. You had books. You had conferences. You had curriculum that was put out. You had online websites that were developed. The whole thing just exploded. In short, we went from hardly anybody had apologetics to nearly everyone, everywhere, in every sphere was doing some form of apologetics. Schools that were against the apologetics movement were now bringing the apologetics movement in. And, you know, I think there are a variety of reasons for this. You know, I mean, practically speaking, if your enrollment's going to go up, you're going to add some programs into the schools. Or if the books are going to sell, publishers are going to publish them. But in general, I don't think that there was anything wrong that happened here in just the explosion of this movement. But this does raise the question, has the apologetics movement in this sense of the term, has it died? And if it has died, what in the world has happened to it? So what I want us to look at is this, is that here's the current reality of it. Just lay of the land. Conferences. First of all, many of the conferences that were started have either dropped significantly in enrollment and attendance or they just don't exist anymore. For example, I know one conference that used to bring in roughly 12,000 people, and it was like an apologetics theology conference that was for lay people. It went from 12 to 10 to 6 to 3,000 people. That's 75% difference with it when the head of their entire movement passed away. I spoke with the conference organizer of it and he thought, man, I don't know if we're gonna be able to continue this the way that it classically was if these numbers keep dropping off. I know another conference that, you know, they used to peak around 2100 and I think the last time I was there, they had like 700. You know, that's, that's two thirds roughly of a decline in it. So we ask ourselves why? And I think there's a lot of reasons but the mood that I pick up from it is the general evangelical culture. And it's not just, oh, we have so many more people who are unconverted and they don't want to go. No, it's an idea of been there, done that. I've been to the conferences. I, I've heard the spiel. I know the same topic. Like we've heard the for the millionth time, like the minimal facts argument for the resurrection. We've heard for the millionth time, the cosmological argument. And there's really nothing new that's going on at these apologetics conferences. I mean, just to be very candid, not being judgmental, it's the same topics by the same people, same time of year, with the same mood, the same feel, the same lines, the same tactics, and so forth. So from just a very basic standpoint, the reason that these conferences aren't growing is because they're no longer relevant. Whereas you have other groups that are still within the broader evangelical world, conservative evangelicals, who are dealing with key topics, the more relevant topics, their conferences are exploding right now. So has the apologetics movement died? No, but their conferences almost have. Like they're still going on. There's still things going on with it but it's nowhere like it was at its heyday. Like the bell curve is on the bottom end of it. In addition to it, what about the publications? Like you're an apologetics guy, you wanna write books, you wanna get into this field. And I've talked with so many people who, like I used to see the publishing world with this quite a bit, like right up front, read the contracts, dealt with it. I knew the checks, I knew the this, I knew the that, I knew everything. And I'm gonna tell you that publishing 
today has radically changed between self-publishing, the costs of it, the relevancy, all the, all the rest, all of those kinds of things have radically changed. But specifically within the apologetics world, I think what we've found is, is that nobody's writing anything new on new topics and in an engaging way that's boistering this entire movement. And here's what I mean by this. You know, there was a time where people were putting out key apologetics work. You know, I think of Norman Geisler's Christian Apologetics, Baker Encyclopedia of Christian Apologetics. I don't have enough faith to be an, ath an atheist. Um, his Christian Ethics, like all these different types of books were booming and selling left and right with it. But when you look at it now and you started to see this happen in the heyday, people wanted to take this higher material and, and bring sort of the cookies down to the bottom shelf. Totally fine with that. I think there's a place for that. But what ended up happening is, is that people ended up writing virtually the same kind of book with the same kind of points to a different type of audience. And we did this for years and years and years. So in this sense, it adds virtually nothing new to the conversation. We all know how many manuscripts we have of the New Testament. Yeah, they may change. Yeah, that data point, but we understand what you mean by it. So my point is, is that has the apologetics movement died? No, but the ability of apologists to write books that are engaging new topics kind of has. And there's a variety of reasons for that, but it's because of the way that we train people an apologetic conference fits this and our publications must follow that specific thing. But again, been there, done that. That's one of the reasons it's almost irrelevant. Again, a lot of the topics that people look at, you know, I've heard it said at one point in time, the 20th century was marked by an apologetic to the hard sciences, whereas the 21st century is going to be marked by an apologetic to the social sciences. But when you look at the way that a lot of apologists during sort of this bell curve, now people are dealing with sort of the social issues today because they've been forced upon us, the LGBTQ, the sexuality issues, the woke issues and all the rest. But in general, when you go to an apologetics conference, the topics that people are using are the same old topics, sometimes with the same old research, sometimes with the same old speakers. And again, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that, but if we want to stay relevant to these types of things, we need to be very clear with people in the way that we train them. They need to know these things. They need to be conversant with these topics. But we have to recognize that one of the key tenets of doing apologetics and evangelism today is, is that you have to be speaking to the issues and the topics at hand for the people. So, for example, throughout the history of the church, we recognize different issues have popped up and become relevant and important, and we deal with them. It doesn't mean that we move on with them, but if we keep acting like we live in that era, we're going to quickly find that the conversation has shifted and the topics at hand that we're addressing are irrelevant. We have to keep doing them. Now, what about speakers? You know, when you look at this, one of the things that I've sort of highlighted is that there are more apologetic speakers today than I have ever seen in my entire life. Like I remember when I was getting into the apologetics movement, you almost sort of like felt like this rogue little crew of people that would go out and there would be nobody that would show up at these events. And you would do all of this research just to kind of get the, eh, that's nice, move on. Now there are podcasts, there are YouTube videos like this. I'm evolving in that sense with it. And there are huge social media outlets with this. I mean, people that you look at and you're like, my goodness, how in the world do they get like half a million YouTube subscribers and all the rest? My point is, is that there are more people doing apologetics today and probably less influence from apologists and apologetics ministries than there were 10 years ago, 20 years ago and so forth. And a few reasons might exist for this. Some of it is, is that whether we like to admit it or not, there is an evangelical industrial complex and the famous speakers have either passed away, retired, or been forced out of the ministry for some reason here, there, or another. But I think another reason for it is, is that 
when you look at the, the influential apologists, I'm not even just talking about quantitatively influential. I'm talking about influence on topics as such. The speakers today, in particular, some of the, the very popular speakers today, they are just not as trained as the earlier apologists. You know, when you look at it, a lot of these guys, and I'm not saying God can't use you if you go out and get a, if you don't go out and get a doctorate. Nobody is saying that. But what I am saying is, is that the, the quality of research being put out by some people that is within the broad apologetics movement, you know, it's kind of dropped off. You know, we have a lot of generic topics with generic research that's a footnote of a footnote of a footnote from the main book that a guy wrote 30 years ago. And it's not the same. And what I'm saying is, yes, we need people that can engage at all of these different levels, but we need people who can still engage at that level. And we're going to get to something else related to that. I mean, sometimes the people that want to go and get you know, higher training and apologetics. In my experience, they go in one of two primary fields. They either go into philosophy or they go into usually New Testament studies. And the philosophy guys get so abstract into analytic philosophy that even full other philosophers have no clue what in the world they're talking about. In fact, I'm not even convinced some of these people actually know what they are talking about or they get so in you know, sort of deep into the New Testament world of all of the literary criticism and genre criticism, all the rest, so you go, guys, do you even believe the Bible anymore? Like, what's going on here? That's another reason for a later topic that's going on here. So the point is, things have significantly changed. So let's come back and answer our question. Has the apologetics movement died? And I think the answer to it is no. Rather, it's lost its relevance, and it lost its relevance for a whole host of the issues that we were talking about, the nature of their conferences, the quality of the research, the types of speakers, the quantity of speakers, no, all the rest. However, in its current trajectory, if the apologetics movement does not change in good, meaningful ways, and some of it is a retrieval of their evangelical identity, but also a change in the sense of returning back to the theological, robust doctrine and integrity of scholarship and so forth, it will die. But I think some of it is, is what's changed also is, is that the platforms have changed. They've shifted away from traditional writing media forms to almost everything's done in the digital world today. YouTube, podcasts, social media, and so on and so forth. You know, they continue to address many of the key issues, but the traditional formats have just radically changed. So if you're listening to this and you're wanting to do apologetics, I'm not discouraging you from going out and writing, but you need to have some kind of other platform in which you engage, period. No ifs, ands, or buts. But I want to deal with these various topics that I brought up. And let's start with this first one. And this one, I think, is probably the one that affects me the most, like very practically as a person who is a trained theologian, ordained minister, and somebody who values significantly doctrinal integrity. I think one of the biggest things that I've noticed within spheres of the apologetics movement is that there has been just the total erosion of theological and doctrinal integrity by apologists, either because they're skeptical and they're just following the research wherever they think that it's going to lead them, or because they want to have a place at the table or whatever reason that it is. But my point is, is that in my opinion, one of the central differences between the present day expression of apologetics and the historic sort of key apologists over the years from the early church all the way up, even to the sort of the precursors of the evangelical movement has been a significant shift in the theological integrity of these apologists. Far too many people in the apologetics movement today are utterly obsessed with the latest trendy idea and topics found in the academy. Now, notice, I'm going to qualify this. Sometimes we don't focus on new topics, or sometimes we do focus on new topics, but when they are focusing on new topics, what happens is, is that the new things that they're embracing, 
sometimes are at fundamental odds with the doctrinal standards that they're claiming to defend. And it happens all the time. These people so desperately want to be viewed as top scholars with non-Christian scholars that they will do almost anything and say almost anything and affirm almost any view in order to be viewed as a scholar. And frankly, when I look at my New Testament and when I read the text of Scripture, I don't see that as being the criterion for faithfulness. Faithfulness in the text of Scripture is to remain true to the sound words of the doctrine of the Word of God that was given to us, period. And I heard it put like this one time. I heard one figure talk about this within evangelical seminaries and the scholarship and, you know, the ways that PhDs can function with this. In particular, he talked about how it works specifically with like young men and this desire for scholarship. And this figure said this. He said, there's no other way to put it, guys. The desire for academic respectability amongst young men is typically greater than the desire for sex. And the room just fell silent because he's right. When you look at so many of these figures, they will do almost anything, say almost anything, give up almost anything within their families in order to put out the book that recognizes them as the scholar. And I think the one book that I always point back to is titled A Place at the Table by George Ladd. The man utterly wrecked his life in this regard, gave up so many things gave up so much of his doctrinal integrity, ruined his family, ruined his life, ended up as a lonely, divorced alcoholic, and nobody ever saw that happening. Beware of it. The other thing is, is that not only do these guys buy into goofy views, but they seem to always buy into the odd views on them. Have you ever noticed this? Like it's trendy right now to be against the inerrancy of the Bible right now. I want to have a a genre-informed view of inerrancy. I'm coming up with my own view of inerrancy. But it's contrary to the view that's taught in the Bible and was affirmed by the history of the church, period. Like, show me some theologian down through the history of the church that's been recognized as affirming the inerrancy of the Bible and yet affirming contradictions in the text of Scripture. There are people who affirm contradictions, but they're not viewed as the orthodox. Or what about people when it's like, they're all giving up the historical atom. They're all buying into theistic evolution or annihilationism or process theology or generic minimalistic Christianity. And each of these views, what we find, are just nowhere taught in the text of Scripture. But so many apologists buy into it. Like It's this running joke where I see something from somebody. Somebody will send it to me. And I made a joke to this guy. I said, before I even look into this article... I'm going to just make the suggestion. This guy does apologetics, doesn't he? And they start laughing. I'm like, not surprised. It's usually the pastors and the theologians that are pushing back against this. But I remember a time when the apologetics movement were the people defending these key things, pushing back against the kooky pastors and theologians, denying these kinds of things. My have the mighty fallen in that sense. And, you know, people ask me, why in the world is this happening? And I honestly think that it's a few things. One, when you find people questioning the word of God and you find people shifting away from the Bible being that authoritative word of God, then your lines of fidelity, doctrinal fidelity, really don't exist. You know, you just have probabilities and consensus concepts and all the rest. And I think so much of that is what's going on is that as a person lowers their view of the Bible, they're going to change their doctrine in accordance with it because it really doesn't matter in that sense. We could talk about that forever. But I actually think the biggest reason for it has been is this whole mere Christianity movement. And this is not a punch to the face to C.S. Lewis. This is really just an issue of you find people today that say all that matters is the core crust of Christianity. God the generic reliability of the Bible. Notice there's a shift even in the definition of the reliability of the Bible today. You have so many people today that say only the big events or some of the core events. doesn't matter if it's a jot and tittle. Every word in the text of Scripture, every event in the text of Scripture is inspired and historically reliable. Just the generic core and the resurrection. That's it. If you can give me God, the mere generic historical 
reliability of the text of scripture and the resurrection, that's all it is. And I go, guys, yeah, in a conceptual sense, yeah, that that could be true. I get what you're saying. But the problem is, is that the New Testament does not present a version of Christianity like that. Jesus didn't just say, oh, as long as you hold to the generic meter, you know, reliability of the scriptures. He says, no, you're an heir because you do not know the scriptures. Or, you know, all that matters is the resurrection and everything else just is irrelevant. All that matters is just the, the resurrection. And yeah, I get what Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians 15. Like, Christ hasn't been raised. We are to be pitied and we are fools and we are hopeless and all the rest. Like, we know what that passage says. But also remember what Paul said in Galatians chapter 1. If anyone presents to you a gospel contrary to the one that you received, let him be a curse or let him be anathema. So what what was that? I mean, they affirm the resurrection. They believe in God and the resurrection. But yet Paul would have considered them anathema because they gave up justification by faith alone. Oh, so maybe there's more. Maybe it's our doctrine of justification. Maybe it can be our doctrine of God. Maybe it can be more into the issues of Christology and all the rest. Maybe it's a maybe the Bible actually presents something radically different than mere Christianity, but rather it's a fully orbed Christianity that we should be calling people to. And again, if your apologetic only cares about this little bit, and this is the whole locus, this is the whole thing that you focus your entire life on, what you win them with is what you're going to win them to, or however the saying goes in that regard. So my point is, is that, yeah, you can go around saying that, but I got a feeling if the Apostle Paul were still alive today, he'd have a letter for these guys. Another thing to consider, and we're just going to quickly go through some of these, church involvement. I think one of the things is, is that many apologists, you know, they are connected to the church, but what does that really mean? In general, I have found that many apologists are connected to the church, but barely connected to the church. They want all of these churches to host their events. They want to participate with those events, but you don't really see them fully engaged in the life of the church. You don't always see a lot of people within the apologetics movement willing to go to Sunday morning services, participate in the Bible studies, participate in the service, the life of the church, the men's Bible studies, whatever it may be, all of those kinds of things. And from a very practical standpoint, when you look at a person who is barely engaged in the church, the, the level of discipleship, the commitment that God calls us to in that regard, as that falls, other issues fall into place with that or fall away in that regard. So a lack of discipleship, there's no accountability for doctrinal errors, or there's laxity towards them. There's been no moral accountability with some of these figures. There's lowering standards for who's actually allowed to teach within the church. And, you know, when we look at this, this is something that it prevails all over the place. It's a symptom really of people buying into just the wishy-washy understanding of what it means to be a faithful church member. And unfortunately, the apologists have bought into the same idea. But when you look at it, why should I have to go on the internet to deal with figures denying the inerrancy of the Bible? Why are there churches not doing anything about it? Like, if you're denying the inerrancy of the Bible, why aren't the elders of your church dealing with it, with you? Because it's a matter of discipleship right there. Or what about the fact, and I'm just going to lift the veil on this, how much immorality has happened within the apologetics community? Not just the apologetics community, the traveling speakers community. For heaven's sakes, if we were connected to the church we would at least have connections of accountability in that regard. I'm not going to say that it's the, you know, the silver bullet to end all of them, but man, it could go a long ways. Man, it could change a lot of these kind of things. It would go a lot further than what we have now. But what we've also found is, is that we just lowered the standards for who should teach within the church. And I have been a long time advocate of you should not have a parachurch ministry if you cannot meet the mere basic requirements of a pastor teacher in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus, period. But you do apologetics, so you can somehow get around some of that. Is that what the New Testament would have us do? Should you have a ministry like that if you don't meet those types of requirements? Show me anywhere in the New Testament that would allow that. 
something to think about. The reality is that the Bible presents a clear case for what is a healthy church and what is a healthy church member. And one of the key facets of classic apologists over the ages is that they were connected and faithful participants within their local church. And if this area collapses, if people just stop committing in this regard, I suspect that the internal aspects of the apologetics movement will continue to corrode internally. I have always said apologists, evangelists, and traveling speakers are not somehow exempt from this basic feature of the Christian life. And I will tell you probably the, the one person who's still alive and still engaging in the apologetics world, who I don't think falls under any of these kinds of criticisms, whom I have the utmost respect for, is Dr. James White. He's an elder in his local church. I mean, think about this. James White serves people as a pastor throughout the week and then goes and debates a Muslim or somebody else at another part of the week. He's not shifting his doctrinal standards here and there just because it's the cool, trendy thing within apologetics to do today. He's engaged and participating in the local church, and that brings accountability in all spheres of his life. The other thing that I want to look at here, just two real quick, is the level of training. We talked about this, and you know what's happened is is that we've really lowered the bar. You know. Go read a couple of books, listen to some podcasts, get on the speakers tour. Why? Because that's generically all you needed to do to get on the apologetics world. But I remember Dr. Wynn Cordwin made this comment where he said, and he argued in a lecture one time that what the world needs today, like the contemporary evangelical world, is we need more B.B. Warfields than X apologists and not like E.X., but generically. And he named the name, and I'm not going to name the name here, but it was just a person who was a pop speaker who had generic scholarship. And you saw him on campuses everywhere doing this, doing that, you know, engaging, trendy, you know, he's wearing like the, the skater bro sh shoes and all the rest, just trying to be the total hipster. But it was very surface level. You know, we're still benefiting from the apologetic of B.B. Warfield and Hodge and all the rest. And, you know, to balance that, what we, we recognize is, yes, we are the body of Christ and we're all members of one body. And I can't say to this guy, I don't need this person. But the apologetics community, we need to raise the bar. We need to raise the bar of the level of training. We need to be committed to doctrinal fidelity and raise the bar. Like, do some new research. Build upon that research. And the last thing is this, conferences, topics. I have no problem with the apologetics conferences in general. But some of them are very odd, very irrelevant, and sometimes it's the same conferences with the same speakers on the same topics, same time of year, same thing, over and over and over again. Now, what I am saying is, is that the topics do change, but some of the topics are historic. Like, yes, we need to have some of those historic topics presented over and over and over again. I think we need to change a little bit of the ways that our apologetics conferences are going on. And to be honest, sometimes these apologetics conferences out of the fear of not being relevant, we're just not academic enough at these kinds of things. I mean, God calls us to renew our minds, to love the truth in this regard, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind by the renewing of your mind. And that doesn't mean shallow thinking. Now, it doesn't mean speaking over people or treating them as though they're dumb or any of the rest, but I cannot tell you how many apologetics conferences I've been to where I can't tell the difference in the speakers and in the mood and the feel of it, whether I'm at a rock concert or a cheesy comedy show. Like if you get up there and you speak for 45 minutes and 20 minutes of your talk are cheesy, corny, stupid jokes. Come on, man. Let the seriousness of the topics that you're dealing with determine the seriousness of the tone that you're bringing to that conference. Let the seriousness of your calling be the reason you raise the bar in the quality of your presentations. In addition, like I said, many of the, the topics will never change, but we need to just realize that the issues are changing. And like I said, we 
have gone from the 20th century that dealt with the reality of the hard sciences and the 21st century is going to deal with all the social sciences. And sometimes when your apologetics conferences aren't dealing with those, they're not going to be hitting the relevant questions of the day. So that said, has the apologetics movement died? No, not yet. But unless we deal with these kinds of issues, it's heading in that direction. So again, I appreciate all of you. Leave any comments below, like pushback comments, anything that you see, extra things onto this. This is just me dealing with this relevant topic at hand. Also, please like and subscribe. I really appreciate it. Thank you.